First of all, I just want to say a huge uh, thank you to the organizers of this um, conference. It's hard to imagine a more welcome invitation than to come to Kyoto at the end of November, the beginning of December. The weather is perfect, and it's a fantastic topic. So thank you so much uh, for the introduction, particularly to Inagaki Sensei, for arranging this uh, conference. And thank you very much to Jeremy for that very generous uh, introduction. I must say I feel very old when you talk about uh, a 30-year career um, like that, but thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, talk today a little bit <coughs> about some of my own research problems and some of the lessons that I've learned from doing research projects, as Jeremy says, over the last 30 years. But there are two key messages that I am interested in. The first is, how is it that the same social scientists can look at the same phenomenon and end up with very different conclusions? This has always puzzled me. And the second one is, why is it that when social scientists make predictions about the way things should happen in the future based on their social science, they then never revisit those predictions later if those things did not happen the way that they expected them to happen? So those are the two themes that I want to explore in the light of my own, uh, my own work. So the outline of uh, my talk, I have to say I'm very impressed by the technology here. I have never seen this before with three different screens in one PowerPoint. The outline of my talk is to start by giving three examples of what I call dominant uh, paradigms of thinking around the topics of Kikoku Shijo and Jido Gyaktai and private universities, which were then contradicted by what happened later. And I want to show how social science can help explain these paradoxes and why, therefore, it is important for social scientists, and that is everybody from lawyers to economists to anthropologists and sociologists, all of us need to be very transparent about our assumptions between what I call our views of society and our views of what I call the person, or personhood is another term for it. And I'm going to use the example of education to tease out some of those assumptions. And then I want to revisit these dominant paradigms and show how they were probably based on certain assumptions which we could call functionalist assumptions about the way that Japanese society operated, which did not take into account other potential intellectual perspectives. And at the very end, I want to suggest that actually the type of intellectual approach, the theoretical approach you take to that relationship between the person and society very often determines your methodological approach also, which is why you have to be so careful at the beginning of a huge project like the one which is being started in Kyoto University here to examine at the very beginning what are your assumptions and therefore, what are the implications for the methodology that you are likely to, to use? So this is my starting. I want to give some examples. And let me start with the example of the Kikoku Shijo. So I'm sure in this audience, everybody knows very well what a Kikoku Shijo is. Um, very often, people defined Kikoku Shijo by what they were not. So Kikoku Shijo were not Konketsuji, they weren't mixed blood uh, children. Uh, they weren't children who'd gone overseas without their parents to, to, to study, for example, like Ryugakse. Um, they weren't the children of people who emigrated overseas with no intention of coming back. They were not the children of Nikkeijin. Uh, they were not tourists, they had to go overseas for at least three months. And of course, when they came back to Japan, they had to be children who went to full-time Japanese schools, children who went to the international schools when they came back. Generally, when the word was invented, were not considered to be Kikoku Shijo. So I'm sure many of you will remember that in the 1970s and the 1980s, the general view of the Kikoku Shijo was that they, were, they would, without doubt, have educational 
and cultural problems when they came back to Japanese society from living overseas. And they would have these problems because of the nature of Japanese society, because Japan was a so-called homogenous society, that it had very strict uh, distinctions between inside the society and outside the society, that Japan had what was called an island country mentality, that Japan had had a long period of seclusion, the Sakoku Jidai, that because Japan was a very conformist society, because of all those issues, it was taken for granted that children who had lived overseas when they came back to Japan would have problems. And people talked about them as being strange Japanese or Han Japa or Chuto Hampa Japa, sort of half-baked or whatever, very negative terms. And there was even a kind of zero-sum formula, which was the amount of time that you had been outside Japan reduced your Japanese-ness. So you were less Japanese depending on how much time you had spent outside um, Japan. And a lot of research was undertaken in the 1970s. A lot of it was undertaken actually in the education department at Kyoto University, which was to measure the extent of the fritikio bio, the non-adaptation problems of these children who had lived outside um, Japan, and to recommend how they could be treated, a very medical model. And the idea was that they would need to be re-Japanized or re-dyed and so on. And one of the really interesting phenomenon was the development of a very large number of special schools, ukiriko, which was set up to help these children when they came back to um, Japan. That's what first interested me uh, in this topic. No other country in the world had special schools for children who had lived overseas uh, when they came back. And what lay behind this uh, model was a very circular argument. The argument was because of the nature of Japanese society, the kikokushijo would have problems when they came back to Japan. And at the same time, because the kikokushijo had problems when they came back to Japan, this explained the way that Japanese society operated. So the, the argument was completely a circular argument. However, evidence began to appear in the late or mid-1980s that actually the Kikoku Shijo were doing rather well in Japanese um, society. They didn't seem to be a new minority that was suffering. They appeared to be becoming increasingly a rather elite group in Japanese um, society. And you could measure this in a number of different ways. You could measure it in terms of the amount of money that the government was spending on their education either outside Japan in Nihonjingako or Hoshuko or in these Ukairiko when they came back to Japan. But also special Tokubetsu Waku, special networks were being set up for these children when they came back to Japan. For example, the Fuzokugako, some of the most elite schools in Japan, were taking these children in very large numbers. It was much easier for them to go there than normal children. But even many universities were setting up special networks. It was three times easier to get into Wasada as a Kikoku Shijo by the early 1980s than it was for a non-Kikoku Shijo um, student. And many companies were setting up networks to help these children uh, come back in. Indeed, in these Ukairiko, there was always a quota of places for children who had not been overseas. And competition for those places was much higher than it was for the Kikoku Shijo. So much so that a strange phenomenon was developing in the early 1980s when families were sending their children overseas while the parents stayed in Japan so that they could then be labeled Kikoku Shijo when they came back to Japan. So this became quite a well-known um, phenomenon. And increasingly, instead of being seen as kawaii-so, as pitiful, they were seen as little internationalists or bunkataishi, cultural ambassadors, or a new kind of elite in society. So the model of the previous decade had been completely um, changed. That's just one example. The next example is about uh, jidogyaktai, or child um, abuse. 
Now, this is very interesting because Japan is one of the very few countries in the world which has ever actually produced a literature which argued that the country was relatively immune, relatively safe from having child abuse because of certain cultural and social features. I've never found that type of literature um, elsewhere. And this literature was around in the late 70s and early 80s. And it argued that Japan was unlikely to have child abuse in the same way that child abuse existed in North America or in European countries because of the stability of the family, because intergenerational living was still carrying on, because there were very low divorce rates, there were very few illegitimate children in Japan at that stage, very few single parents, and parenting as an occupation had a high status. So women in Japan who stayed at home and looked after children, it was argued, had a much higher status than that same uh, activity in other countries. People also argued in this literature that Japan had very stable communities. You had local policing. Your police lived in the local area. They knew all the households. They would know if there was a problem. Uh, the schools in Japan and the teachers were much more involved in what happened in the house, whereas in most countries they didn't get involved beyond the school gate. And of course, a lot of people talked about community-based social work, the minsein, jido minsein system, where your social workers in Japan lived in your community, unlike in most countries where your social workers lived outside your community and came in during the daytime and went away in the evening. And some people even argued that practices such as co-sleeping and co-bathing with children actually reduced the chances of child abuse, particularly sexual abuse, happening in Japan. And the fact that Japan overall was a stable society with low crime rates, stable economy and stable social conditions, all of these were argued in the 1970s and 80s as explanations for why Japan was unlikely to have a problem of child abuse. However, as most of you know, over the next decade or so, Japan discovered, if that's the expression, the problem of child abuse. And they developed a kind of panic during the 1990s of endemic child abuse existing in Japan. So that the figures increased from 1990 when there was probably uh, only about 800 cases uh, reported in Japan to the end of 2000 when the numbers were well over 30,000. And you got headlines in newspapers such as child abuse in Japan increases by 50 times over 10 years, headlines like that. So there was a kind of panic that there was huge child abuse problems in Japan, exactly the same as in the other countries. The third example I want to give you is the one that I'm interested in at the moment, which is about private universities in Japan, particularly the lower level, sometimes called politely the second tier private universities uh, in Japan. There was a huge literature about this in the early 2000s. These are just a few of the books um, I could find uh, to show you, but there was a huge literature about this. And what the literature said was that private universities in Japan were going to have a very tough time for the next 15 years or so. So they said that they were under threat from a changing demography and a whole new language was introduced such as the Zenyu Jidai. 2007 was going to be the year when the number of applicants was the same as the number of places. Tain Wari, the under-enrollment problem, which means they would stop getting government funding. And the, uh, the end of Nishi Kaikaku, the reform of the examination system, because basically these universities would take anybody who would um, apply. And at the same time, there was this literature that the universities needed to respond to this pressure by becoming more professional and becoming more competitive. So you had the whole Jinka process in the national universities. You had COE and COL uh, and so on. And finally, the literature said that the students should now be treated very differently. They needed to be treated to be treated like customers 
rather than a student, and they needed to be helped particularly in the labor market. So a whole new language came out. And the predictions were that there would be a dramatic drop in enrollment and in revenue, that universities would start going bankrupt, that there would be a collapse of the entrance examination and the Hensachi system, there would be a devaluing of university credentials, and alternative markets would have to develop to fill the space. So these books were very consistent in what they said was going to happen to the private universities over the next 15 uh, years. However, if we look at the data, the story is very different. You can see that the number of private universities has actually grown during this uh, period. The number of students has gone up. The proportion of students going to private universities has gone up. The revenue has gone up. Government subsidies have gone up. The only thing that has changed a tiny bit is that the government subsidy per student has dropped off a little bit. But otherwise, these data have all gone in the opposite direction to what was predicted in 2003 and 2004 by social scientists. So these weren't journalists, these were social scientists working, mostly academics, working in universities. So just to look a bit more detail, the argument was that many Japanese universities were going to go bankrupt. The most common number that was given, if you read many of these books, that around 150 universities or 30% of the private universities would have disappeared within the next 15 uh, years. In fact, some universities have disappeared, but if you look closely at them, very few have actually gone bankrupt. Most of them have either been absorbed or they have been converted into public universities or in some cases where they've disappeared, the Gakohojin that they were part of is still there. I can only find three cases where a whole Gakohojin has actually disappeared. Three cases when they were predicting there would be about 150. And at the same time, many other universities, new universities, have opened. So if you look at Japanese private universities in 2018, they look very similar to the way they looked in 2003. In fact, they look very similar to what they looked like in 1990. The Gakohojin is still the default business model. Teaching high school leavers in classrooms is still the default educational model. Entrance exams still exist. The Hensachi system is still very powerful. Uh, the value of the university degree is probably, if anything, more valuable because the employment market is less secure. And what is very curious is very little development of new market. There are very few part-time students, very few uh, mature students, shakaijin, uh, gakusei. And although there is some increase in international students, it's not nearly as big as perhaps you might have expected. And interestingly, there's a new literature that's just appearing. This book came out, it's a very good book that came out a couple of years ago by Ogawa Sensei, looking at what's going to happen to private universities over the next, the next 12 years. Because as you know, in 2018, this year, is the beginning of another drop in the number of 18-year-olds for the next 12 years. But what I find interesting about this new literature, it doesn't go back to 2003, four, and say, well, what happened last time we made predictions? Why didn't we re-examine what happened uh, the last time? So my question is, how can social science as a discipline deal with some of these apparent paradoxes where we predict one thing and what happens then looks very different? And my argument is that social scientists need to be transparent about their assumptions, as I said before, about the relationship between what we call society and what we call um, the person. And we also need to be sensitive to how people define the concept of society and how they define the concept of um, the person. You'll notice, by the way, that 
these days anthropologists, certainly uh, anthropologists in the UK, tend not to use the word individual. They use the word person because the word individual is very much seen as a Western concept that came out of a particular historical moment and has a particular set of um, implications. And the word person is considered to be a much more neutral term of the unit of one person. So the definition is the varies from society to society. But one's assumption about that relationship is very often what determines the way you undertake your um, approach. And I can give you a perhaps easiest because everybody here is a specialist on educational studies and all of you know this already, the example of educational theory. So certainly the way educational studies is taught in the UK is that you think of society and you think of society and the person as being divided essentially into three different strands so that uh, any sociologist will tell you that you have to first of all distinguish between structuralist theories which look at how society constrains or controls the behavior of the person on the one hand and what we sometimes call social action theories or interpretive theories which is how the person or persons create the world around them or create society around them and within structuralist theories we all know that there are two main strands those based on the theory that society or the assumption that society is essentially a consensual nature that people all want to work together versus theories which essentially are conflictual, which see societies based on a conflict essentially between those who own the means of production and those who work for those who own the means of production. And we know that functionist theories are very often seen as coming out of European tradition, the French tradition of Emile Durkheim, and we know the distinction on the Marxist theories that comes out of Marxist work. So we know that structuralist theories go down one side and we know that on the other side social action theories looking at how the person or persons control or create the world around them essentially is based on conflict because it's a struggle over symbols and rituals and very often is associated with the work of the German sociologist Max Weber. So if I give you a very simple a couple of examples if you look at the education system of any society and if you think of education just as a black box don't think about what actually happens inside the education system but think of education as a black box in a functionalist theory what happens is that your raw material your preschool children are fed into the system and what comes out at the other end of the system is what your economic or your political or your economic uh, systems need for the society to operate efficiently. And we know in a Marxist theory that where you are fed into the education system is determined by your social class background. And that gives you a comparative advantage or disadvantage compared to other people. And you are being trained not for any job, but for particular roles in society, which are considered to be suitable for your social class context or your social class background. So uh, I tried to very quickly summarize and forgive me, it, it's, it's perhaps too simple, but essentially functionalists describe the relationship between educational systems and other institutions, while Marxists explain why those relationships exist over time. Functionalists uh, see socialization as a common value that binds people together Marxists see it as, if you like, differentiating people by social class. And functionalists see education system as offering opportunities for mobility, whereas functionalists see, sorry, functionalists see uh, education as offering opportunities for mobility, while Marxists see education as maintaining structured social inequality. I'm sure you're all very familiar um, with those distinctions. And I'm going to come back to this later. The fact is we are familiar with these things, but we often don't actually take them to our own work. So those, the Marxist and functionalist theories, Weberian social action, interpretive theories are interested about what happens inside that black box. 
how is it that the people inside those black boxes actually react? Because they start from the assumption that teachers and pupils and parents are not passive, they are active agents in the world in which they operate. So pupils react differently to what schools are trying to do, i.e. the school goals, and how the schools are trying to meet those school goals, the school means. Some of them actually accept the school goals and they accept the way the school is trying to meet those goals, what we might call a conformist pupil. Some of them are the ones who accept what the school is trying to do, but do it in their own way. They are the innovative pupils. Those are the ones that end up at Kyoto University, generally speaking, and so on. So the argument is that different pupils react differently to teaching because they're not passive and teachers react differently to the curriculum because they are not passive um, also. So if we take that very simple idea of uh, structuralist versus social action theory or Marxist Weberian and Durkheimian ideas and then reapply them, what we often seem to discover in the case of research on Japan is that they tend to ignore Marxist and Weberian theories sometimes in these dominant paradigms and be very much stuck into a functionalist paradigm. So if we go back to the example of the Kikokushijo, I would argue that the reason that the original paradigm of the Kikokushijo as being a new minority who needed to be pitied, who weren't fully accepted into Japanese society, was because it ignored who were the parents of those children. They were very often powerful business leaders, they were journalists, they were people who worked for government. They were not going to allow their children to become a new minority. They were going to insist, they were going to protect the role of their children in society because they themselves were powerful and important people in society. At the same time, they were able to draw on a new rhetoric of coxaika that was very powerful at the time. And they were able to draw on the fact that companies in Japan were often trying to find a small group of elite workers who could drive coxaika without upsetting the normal pattern of workers that they had in the company. And they were able to draw on the fact that many schools in Japan were facing demographic problems already and again were trying to attract new pupils and they could also use the coxsaika rhetoric. So there were various interest groups that were interested in having a more positive evaluation of the uh, Kikoku Shijo. At the same time, the Kikoku Shijo became the subject of a number of very active debates both by the parents of the Kikoku Shijo and the teachers of the Kikoku Shijo, but also the Kikoku Shijo themselves about what it was to be Japanese. Debates about such things as um, how they should be perceived, how they should behave, uh, and so on. They were not, if you like, passive agents in all of this um, process. So teachers, for example, in schools that had many Kikoku Shijo, would argue about what is the best way to teach these students. And they said it depends whether we need to make these children into a Japanese style citizen or an international type of citizen. Should we emphasize the importance of groupism or individualism, cooperativeness over being independent? Should we see these children in one way or another way? So the children became part of a symbolic debate that teachers were having in that school over what type of a student they should be um, producing. And again, we needed to see those debates to understand that there was nothing static about the concept of the Kikoku Shijo. It was being, if you like, debated and challenged all of the time that that was happening during the 1970s and the 1980s. The discovery of child abuse actually is a particularly interesting story. The beginning of the debate about child abuse started with the owners of the private child welfare institutions in the early 1990s who were struggling because they didn't have enough children to maintain their children's homes, the Yoko Shisetsu that they were running. I went to a very strange conference, actually in Kyoto, in 1991, 
with all the heads of the children's homes, the Yoko Shisetsu, in Japan, so about 530 of them. At that time, about 90% of the Yoko Shisetsu, the children's homes, were private. And the headline, the banner at the front of the conference was, how are the children's homes going to deal with the problem of the lack of children? And so in most countries, not having children in care would have been seen as a good thing. But for them, it was a problem because it was their business. Now, they knew there were problems in Japanese society. They knew there was a problem of child abuse, but there wasn't enough awareness about it. So they were the people who did the original research. They were the people who collected the original data, and they were the ones who started the debates about the problem of child abuse in Japanese society. They were supported by the debates that were happening at that time around the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child Children. Nichi Benren, the Japanese Lawyers Association, was a very powerful ally in those debates. And the media picked it up. The Asahi Shimbun in particular ran many, many articles about the problem of child abuse in Japan. And that was the, the beginning of leading to definition. You had to define child abuse first. And then people began to survey it and to measure it, and then they began to bring in new legislation. So there were interest groups that were pushing those debates that led to the discovery of child abuse. And these new narratives that were happening, one reason that they were so powerful at the time is because there was a bigger, the wider debate that was happening in Japan about the lack of children in general in the um, society. And that led to new explanations about the breakdown of the family, absent fathers, lack of support for mothers, uh, and so on. I haven't got time for this, but this just shows you that in most societies, child abuse becomes discovered, becomes legislated, children are taken into care, and very often there are then problems about the care system, which leads to them coming out of care into the community. And then child abuse gets forgotten again. We can document over the last 150 years how roughly in Europe and in West North America, every 30 years or so, there's a new child abuse panic. It's a circular um, system. It happens regularly. So Japan wasn't unique about this. Where Japan was unique was that it had a literature that tried to explain why Japanese society meant that child abuse was less likely to happen in Japan uh, than elsewhere. Again, if we go back to the question of the private universities, why are they surviving much more than we expected? Because there are many interest groups that want them to survive. Many private universities are family businesses, particularly in the Kansai area, maybe as many as 30 or 40% of the lower level private universities are family run uh, universities. They also provide a place for senior academics when they retire from national universities to go and work. Plus, the, many, the student demand is driven by the fact that most of the pupils are students whose parents have not been to university themselves. They're what are called first-generation uh, pupils. So there are certain interest groups, again, that are pushing the survival of protecting of private universities. And that also has led to interesting debates around the private universities and their future, asking questions about things such as what are professors? Are they teachers or are they researchers? Are university education about career preparation or is it about producing a kind of person ready for society? Are students consumers? Are universities businesses? Major debates have been taking place over the what is the nature, what is the future of universities? But around this question of what will happen to the private universities, over the next 15 or 20 uh, years. So coming towards my conclusion here, I want to suggest that first of all, the first question one needs to decide when undertaking any research project is, how do you see that relationship between whatever it is you're defining, call it society, and your concept of the person? Are you more interested in how society constrains the activities of the person, or are you more interested in how a person creates the world around you? And I want to suggest, because if you go back and look at most research programs and most research projects, that decision will very often drive the methodology of the project, because in general, 
Structural theories, structural models, require some kind of quantitative research analysis. You need to be able to collect data to measure the extent to which um, uh, society constrains social action. Whereas if you are more interested in how the person creates the world around them, that generally demands qualitative research projects because you have to understand the perception of the person in a particular context over a long period of time and hear the narratives and the debates that are taking place uh, in that context. So structural theories generally demand quantitative methods. Interpretive theories generally often lead to qualitative methods. So that's why it's such an important thing to examine at the beginning of a project. And just finally, what are the implications of this for this fantastic project which is just kicking off at uh, Kyoto University, which I'm really excited about. I mean, I'm really interested about how we can uncover something about the nature of Japanese, the character of Japanese education. I just think it's important that however the project is designed, it needs to be able to account for both structuralist and social action theories. It needs to be able to account for conflict theories and consensus theories. We can't take just one angle on this. We need to be able to take into account all of the different angles, even if in the end we end up privileging one position over another position. It needs to understand the Japanese concepts of the person and how the person is viewed in Japan, not a Western concept of the individual. So we must start with the local understanding and need to understand the Japanese concept of society and how that is currently viewed in Japan at the minute, not again a Western concept. So it must come from within an understanding of the Japanese local position, even if it has a comparative element. And finally, my suggestion is that it should use a mixture of both quantitative and qualitative research methods in order to get the richest possible amount of data and analysis um, that is possible. So that's my story. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.